What an honor it is to be in your presence this morning, Lord, to celebrate the greatest love ever shown, the greatest power ever displayed, the victory over death forever. And Lord, as we, we come to your word this morning, would, would you speak through me? Would you use your words in my mouth? But would you open all of our, our minds and our hearts to accept and hear what it is you are saying? Holy Spirit, come and speak to us this morning as we welcome you amongst us. In Jesus' name. Amen. So, he is risen. Wow, such clever guy. Yes, I love it. So I want to set a little bit of a context before we start. And I want to invite you to imagine, to to stir up that imagination that God has given you. And imagine that you're a silent witness in Jerusalem just over 2,000 years ago. Just think about it. It's Sunday. And it's been an incredible weekend. It's been momentous in everything that has happened On Friday, Jesus was taken to trial before Pilate. The Jewish religious leaders had found him guilty. But the Roman judge found him innocent. And yet, he was still tortured and nailed to a cross until he died. And on Friday afternoon, late in the the afternoon, Joseph had taken his body and buried him in a tomb. And the Romans had placed soldiers around that tomb because they didn't want his body stolen. But before sunrise, on that Sunday morning, the woman went to embalm the body. Only to find that the stone had been rolled away and there was no body in the tomb. Now just think, Mary Magdalene stands before the tomb crying because the body is missing and suddenly someone is standing before her talking to her. It was Jesus risen and alive, talking to Mary. And what does she do? She greets him and then she runs to tell the disciples that he is no longer there, buried. And she had spoken to him because he is alive. He is risen. He is risen indeed. You know, that's not the end of the story. It's the beginning of life with Jesus. Because the whole day passes. The disciples were still too afraid to go outside. They were fearful of what the religious leaders would do. They were fearful of the reprisals that would be held against them. And so as we turn to the scriptures, we read in John chapter 20, verses 19 to 22, that Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. Suddenly, now, here's a quick aside, here's a challenge. If you really want to have some uh, exciting times, do a, a Bible search on the word suddenly and read what happens in all the suddenlies. Right, sorry. Suddenly, Jesus was standing there amongst them. Peace be with you, he said. 
And as he spoke, he showed them the wounds in his hands and in his side, and they were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. And again he said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. And then he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. And in this, these short verses of Scripture, there's a, a whole load of clues of how Jesus communicated and what he did when he appeared to his disciples. As his first appearance to his disciples, what he did and what he said must be important. So we're going to take a closer look. And I want us to observe Jesus' words and actions to his followers as we begin with just looking at his actions. In verse 19, the scripture says, That Sunday evening the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. And suddenly Jesus was standing there amongst them. Peace be with you, he said. Three observations. Firstly, the doors were locked. Secondly, the disciples were frightened. And thirdly, Jesus meets them where they are. These three facts reveal clues to us how Jesus will interact with us today. And it starts off with, by saying, nothing stops Jesus. Hiding behind locked doors does not stop him. Jesus did not have to knock. Right? He didn't even have to open the door. He didn't crawl through a window. The word says, suddenly he was there. Now turn your imagination back on again. Imagine you having a braai in your entertainment area of the back garden of your house, hidden behind the electric gates in the secu security complex. Some of your church friends are with you to make it okay. Right? But just before the meat is taken off the fire, suddenly, without you having to open the front door or the security gate, or phone the front gates of the complex to allow somebody in, suddenly, the guy whose funeral you attended on Friday is standing there. Hey, I don't know about you, but I'd have to go home to change my underwear. <laughs> suddenly, <laughs> What the disciples show us is that Jesus was recognizable. They could see him. They recognized him. They could see that he wasn't a ghost. He wasn't imagined by them all. It, it wasn't a, a sort of mass hysteria that was taking place. Later we read that he shows them his wounds and he invites them to touch him. And see that he has a physical body, similar to ours, but different. He can be touched, he can eat, but he also passes through walls and doors. If you turn to the Gospel of Luke, we read exactly the same things and we get a, a slightly different perspective. In Luke chapter 24, verses 37 to 43, it says, the whole group was startled and frightened, thinking they were seeing a ghost. Why are you frightened? Jesus asked. Why are your hearts filled with doubt? Look at my hands, look at my feet. You can see it's really me. Touch me. Make sure I'm not a ghost. Because ghosts don't have bodies, as you see that I do. And as he spoke, he showed them his hands and his feet. And still they stood there in disbelief, filled with joy and wonder. I need to pause. Those, that, that, that phrase really caught my attention because I was imagining the emotions that were going on in the disciples. 
disbelief at what they were seeing with their eyes, yet filled with joy and wonder. <clears throat> then he asked them, do you have anything here to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he ate it as they watched. Now I'm going to reveal my age a bit. But I was a fan of comic books. Anybody remember those things? Right? For those who don't know what a comic book is, uh, it was a paperback with pictures in it. Right? About my level of reading, yes. Uh, and my, one of my favorite comic books was Casper the Friendly Ghost. <laughs> right? There was a movie, the same name, earlier. And the one thing that has always stuck in my brain about Casper was whenever he ate something, you could watch it fall straight through onto the ground. Right? Jesus was no ghost. The disciples watched as he ate fish with them. And they couldn't see the food working its way down through his body. You see, the resurrected Jesus is the first example of what a body resurrected from the dead will look like when he comes again. Of what a body called, what our bodies, when we are called up to join him in the sky, that's what our bodies are going to look like. Oh, um. We will be identifiable. We'll be able to eat. We'll be able to talk. We'll be able to touch. Uh, to, be, to touch and be touched. But we will not be bound by physical walls or locked doors. That's who we will be when Jesus comes again. Amen. Well done. Well said. Yes. The fact that the disciples were in hiding and Jesus suddenly appeared amongst them also means that today, in my life, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, Jesus can go where no one else can go. He can go where, my do where no doctor, no counselor, no friend of mine can go to. In other words, he can speak into areas of my life where nobody else can. He meets us wherever we are, whatever our need is, anywhere and at any time. There is no situation, there is no place where Jesus cannot meet with us. You see, being resurrected from the dead equipped Jesus to do what no other person can do. Because there is such convincing evidence, both biblical and historical, that he is the only person ever who has demonstrated the reality of his resurrection. And he did it multiple times in, before multiple people, more than 500 people, after his death and burial. So we can accept and hang on to and celebrate that Jesus is alive because Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Now the second action that we see taking place uh, with Jesus is after Jesus was arrested, his disciples were fearful that they would suffer the same fate. But fear does not stop Jesus. Those disciples did not know what the future held for them. They were filled with shame at their actions of running away and deserting Jesus. And yet Jesus meets with them. Now you know, today in our times... 
We could also allow anxiety and fear to control our decisions and our actions. Because come on, let's be real. We face uncertainty. We don't know if there's going to be electricity available tomorrow. We don't even know if we can afford the petrol to keep the generators running. Uh, There's political instability all around us. We don't know what's coming. Crime seems to be totally out of control. And we are unsure regarding the financial future of the country, our beloved country. And if we focus on all these things and others, we can allow fear and anxiety and worry to begin to take hold of us. But our answer is that we know Jesus as the risen, living King of all kings, ready, able, and willing to meet us even when we allow fear to take over. He comes to us when we cry out to him for help. He guides us and helps us to overcome all fear, all worry, all anxiety. Because his promise in Isaiah 41 verse 10 goes like this. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. Don't be discouraged, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. And I will help you. I will hold you up with my victorious right hand. And when he does that, nothing can stand against him. And then the third action, we see Jesus suddenly appearing in their midst in verse 19. There was nothing hesitant about Jesus appearing amongst them. He did not stand outside and call them. He wanted the disciples to see him as fully, completely involved with them. He's not going to be a distant God, you know, somewhere up there on a cloud playing a harp. Not a chance. He wants to be here, involved in every area of our life. He doesn't want to mess around. He doesn't want to mess us around. Because he needed those disciples to understand and see him clearly and to believe in him and to trust and love him as the risen and alive Jesus. And that's what he calls us to as well. That's his desire for everyone today. He wants all of us to know him to experience him as the living Jesus. Not as some words in a book, but a relationship with an alive Jesus. Yeah, that's what I want. I want to know him so well. And, he, and I want him to know me just as well, alive. It's what we pray for, for each and every single one of you, that every Sunday you would have an experience with Jesus, that he would be alive, glorious in our midst, that every day of our life we would experience Jesus and not just know him or know about him, but experience him. So the three things that Jesus did uh, was he appeared behind locked doors, he appeared even though they were, were fearful, and he appeared suddenly amongst them. But he also said three things. And those three things uh, are gifts to us. Gifts for us to take away, far better than a chocolate egg. Three important phrases that he said whilst he was in in their midst. 
And his words were that he, that he spoke to them were the gift of peace, the gift of power, and the gift of purpose. <clears throat> now, when it comes to the gift of peace, twice Jesus said, peace be with you. In that little piece of scripture that we read, it's mentioned twice. Now, there's one thing that I know. When the Bible repeats something, it, we better pay attention because it's important. You know, uh, when the Bible repeats something, it's to get my attention. When the Bible repeats something, it's to get my attention. Okay. Right. Because I know me. It takes lots of repetition before I learn something. Uh, it's like when Shirley says to me, I'm tired of repeating myself. You never listen to me. And my reply was, I'm sorry, dear, what did you say? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Oh dear. Oh dear. There's a fight happening. What? And then the fight started. <laughs> Jesus says, Peace be with you. And then he speaks about power and purpose. Because he wants us to live from a place of peace. And we only get to that place of peace when we're trusting only Him with our entire life. You know, if peace is the antidote to anxiety and fear. And in Philippians 4, verse 6 and 7, we read about the key to peace. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need. Thank him for all he has done. Do you notice there's some keys here, aren't there? Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. And his peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Jesus Christ. It's only when we choose to be totally reliant on Jesus and to trust him with everything in our life. Only then will we know peace. Because Jesus is our peace. Ephesians 2 verse 14 says, Christ himself has brought peace to us. In his own body on the cross, he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us from God. The unfortunate truth is, not everybody can say that they live with peace. Only when I submit my life to the risen, living Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior will I know the peace I lead. And that's it. Do this one thing. Submit my life. And he gives us his peace. There is no other way. Now, we started this morning with the gift of peace because it is foundational for using power, God's power, and to achieve God's, uh, our God-given purposes. So the second words that Jesus spoke was he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Receive the gift of power. Holy Spirit is the power of God dwelling in you and me. Holy Spirit is the power of God dwelling in you and me. The same God who created the entire universe. The same God who healed the sick who made the blind see, the deaf hear, the lame walk, who raised Jesus from the dead. That's the power, God's power, in you 
and me. Hey, it's very quiet in this place. The Bible says we will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on us. You will be my disciples, telling people about me. Uh, you, sorry, you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, that is close by to where you stay, right throughout Judea, the surrounding towns, in Samaria, the whole of Gauteng, and to the ends of the earth. Who, me, Lord? I couldn't do that. Yes, you can. Because living in you is God's Holy Spirit who can do anything. Because the work of the Holy Spirit is to enable us to do what we simply cannot do on our own. He gives us power for a reason. And that's the power to fulfill our purpose and to bring glory to God. That's it. Which brings us straight to the third gift spoken by Jesus, the gift of purpose. <clears throat> Jesus and Holy Spirit are our only hope to accomplish the purpose he's he has for us. And our purpose is found in John chapter 20, verse 21. As the Father sent me, so I'm sending you. We don't get to just come along on Sundays and sit and say, that's it, I've done my duty. Holy Spirit in us makes us. He encourages us. He, he, he pushes us to be his sent one. Because he wants us to live in the world as his representative, as ambassadors of his kingdom. He's saying he wants us to take his peace and his power and to glorify God the way he did. And he does, we do that by doing and saying what Jesus did. Because we are always to be ready to plead to convince others, to return to a relationship with God who loves everyone. Who loves everyone so much that he gave his son for all of us. 1 Corinthians 5.20 says, We are Christ's ambassadors, and God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. That's our purpose. And without the risen, living Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we cannot fulfill our purpose. And so as an ambassador of Christ myself, I urge you, if you haven't yet, be reconciled with God. Make peace with him. Come back to him. Because he's calling on you to be part of his family, to receive his gifts. The gift of peace, the gift of power, and the gift of his purpose. And so as we start wrapping up, we cannot fulfill our God-given purpose by hiding away in fear behind locked gates. But the living, risen Jesus is our solution our only solution. As our Lord and Savior, his peace and power are ours only when we choose to intentionally live for him every day. And so today, we remember that we live for a risen, living Jesus because Christ is risen he is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Let's pray together.